So I talked about adaptive designs and how they, for clinical trials, and how they are becoming increasingly used um, in all of medical research and all of drug development, medical device development, um, and the adaptive designs to identify which patient populations are benefiting uh, in the context of a clinical trial, uh, to identify which uh, drugs are, being are, are most effective, to identify what doses should be used um, in future trials, um, and I talked especially about uh, a clinical trial, a screening process, a phase two screening process for drugs called iSPY2 uh, in the context of neoadjuvant breast cancer. So many of the drugs that we investigate are targeted therapies, um, and sometimes we know that it's hitting the target. Sometimes we're not sure what the target is, mm -hmm. uh, and even if we are sure what the target is, we're not sure that there aren't other associated uh, pathways that the drug is affecting. Uh, and so our, our, our standard is to start out in all of breast cancer, in all of the high-risk breast cancer. These are patients who are uh, stage two or three disease uh, that tend to have large tumors, um, and um, they, some express particular biomarkers, some don't. So we address the effect in that disease and then home in on the responding subsets. Uh, the responding subsets may be the target of a particular agent, um, or it might be a bigger subset of patients. It might be, as in some cases we've seen, uh, we think it hits a target, but in fact it's good in the non-target as well. Uh, if you think back to other diseases, I mean, we've, we have um, drugs that we've decided are great for preventing hair loss that we were originally looking at for um, blood pressure, um, or, uh, or that it's great for erectile dysfunction, mm -hmm. uh, even though the original uh, indication was uh, uh, blood pressure. So uh, we don't know uh, that we're hitting the target uh, always, but we have many drugs in the trial that are specifically um, uh, supposed to be inhibiting particular targets that we measure. Oh yes, there are there are HER2 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. There are uh, pan HER family inhibitors that we're considering. The biomarker signatures that we're um, so there, there are various biomarkers that we address in the trial. Mm -hmm. um, there are biomarkers that drive the trial. Okay. Those are hormone receptor status, HER2, and mammoprint. So think of a two by two by two um, uh, factorial. So, so there are eight cells. A patient who enters the trial falls into one of these cells. And we investigate um, whether patients in that cell are responding to the addition of an experimental therapy, uh, the addition being to um, uh, standard therapy. That's right, mm -hmm. and if the drug is not effective for a particular subset, uh, the woman would not be assigned to that. You know, mm -hmm. Thinking forward into the future, into clinical practice, the woman would not get that. It, it, there's no question in breast cancer and other cancers and other diseases, we overtreat patients. Mm -hmm. um, we don't purposely overtreat patients. We, we don't know whether they benefit or not. So the idea is not only to find the responding subset, but very importantly, the complementary subset who don't benefit from a therapy. And that has a benefit for patients, but it also has the benefit for drug development, because if we know 
which subsets of patients, or we have information about subsets of patients that benefit and don't, we can exclude the latter from the clinical trial. And that means we can do a clinical trial with a few hundred patients instead of a few thousand patients. from her physicians. If she has breast cancer, uh, she can discuss with her physicians, and most of them know what trials are going on mm -hmm. that they have access to. Um, if she goes to, in this country, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, she can see the range of trials. Essentially, every trial is on that website. She can see the range of trials that are being offered uh, and where they are being offered. 